Well, in our Old Testament survey, we have so far connected the dots from Abraham to his sons Isaac and Ishmael to Isaac's twin sons Esau and Jacob. And of course, uh, of these, Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob are commonly referred to in the Bible and in uh, Judeo-Christianity as the patriarchs. Now note of these five names that I listed, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Esau, and Jacob, that Ishmael and Esau are left out. They are not considered patriarchs. The reason for this is simple. The term patriarchs, as used in the Holy Scriptures, speak of two things only. Hebrews and the specific God-chosen descendants of Abraham through whom the covenant that the Lord made with Abraham would continue in perpetuity. This is a critical issue that has resurfaced especially in modern times with the re-emergence of Islam as the enormous and dominant religion that it is, even if it had gone under the radar to the Western world since the end of the Ottoman Empire as a result of World War I. Now Esau went on to become a founder of the tribes of Edom. And since they lived on the edge of the Arabian Peninsula, they have largely become assimilated into the Arab tribes. Ishmael is the founder of the Arab tribes. And there has been a permanent enmity between the Hebrews and the Arabs since Abraham sent his concubine, Hagar, and her child Ishmael away. So, the descendants of Esau and Ishmael are, generally speaking, Arabs. Arabs are Semites. They are descendants of, son, of Noah's son Shem, as are Hebrews. However, they are Gentiles. So, Arabs are Semites, but Gentiles. Hebrews are Semites, but they are also Hebrews. That's the split. Now we read, we read uh, in, how in Genesis 17, the Lord instructed Abraham that even though Ishmael was indeed biologically and by custom Abraham's firstborn son, that the son born later to Abraham's legal wife Sarah, who was Isaac, was to be considered as Abraham's firstborn for both inheritance purposes and, more importantly, as the next Hebrew to carry on the line of the covenant promises. Though we didn't cover it last time, <clears throat> Abraham bore other children through other women as well. However, only those children born from Sarah were considered as Hebrews. All others were Gentiles. And the only child born to Sarah was Itzach. So while Abraham fathered both Hebrews and Gentiles, as did his son Isaac father both Hebrews and Gentiles, only Abraham's grandson Jacob fathered exclusively Hebrews. Jacob fathered no Gentiles. And as we discovered late in Jacob's life, the Lord assigned him a new name, Israel, Israel. The twelve sons who came from Jacob were therefore Hebrews and came to be called Israelites, descendants of Israel, sons of Israel. All Israelites, therefore, are Hebrews. Therefore, the separation now of Hebrews from Gentiles was complete at this point. Now, as we ended our previous lesson, Jacob's 11th son, Joseph, had been sold to Arab slave traders by his 10 jealous older brothers. Joseph was clearly Jacob's favorite son. And the Arabs, in turn, sold Joseph to the chief steward of the pharaoh of Egypt. And after serving the steward, the chief steward Potiphar, for a time, Potiphar's wife leveled false charges against Joseph, resulting in a prison sentence. <clears throat> However, the pharaoh 
began having recurring nightmares that although the Pharaoh's seers couldn't interpret, Joseph could. And the nightmares turned out to be a vision of a time of plenty that would be immediately followed by a widespread long-term famine. Joseph was put in charge as the vizier of Egypt to ready Egypt for what was coming, and he did so very successfully. As the famine took hold, back up in Canaan, where Joseph's father Jacob and all the Israelites lived, they were running out of food. Jacob sent his sons to Egypt to buy grain. There they found Joseph. Joseph was married to an Egyptian woman named Azanath, and they produced two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now it must be clear that these two children were Egyptians, and they were raised as Egyptians. Now in Egypt, under Joseph, the twelve tribes prospered and they grew. But Joseph, uh, rather Jacob, was now a very old man. He knew he was nearing his death. So he calls for his son Joseph to come to him and to bring those two Egyptian-born sons with him. What happened next cannot be overstated, as it would have significant impact on the progress of Israel and also as, uh, has prophetic significance for our time and for beyond. Jacob sought to bless these, these two sons of Joseph. But he did it in a radical way that caught his son Jacob, uh, Joseph rather, completely off guard. The strange blessing is known as Jacob's cross-handed blessing. I want you to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 48. We're going to read it all. This is the story of the cross-handed blessing. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 55. Genesis 48, starting at verse 1. After, let's see, a while later, someone told Yosef, Joseph that his father was ill. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Jacob was told, here comes your son Joseph. Israel, Jacob, gathered his strength and sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, El Shaddai appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and he blessed me, saying to me, I will make you fruitful and numerous. I'll make you a group of peoples. I will give this land to your descendants to possess forever. Now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh will become as much mine as Reuben and Shimon, Simeon are. The children born to you after them will be yours. But for purposes of inheritance, they're to be counted along with their older brothers. Now as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died suddenly as, they were, as we were traveling through the land of Canaan, while we were all still some distance from Ephrat. So I buried her there on the way to Ephrat, also known as Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Then Israel noticed Joseph's sons and said, Who are these? Yosef answered his father, These are my sons whom God has given to me. Yaakov replied, <clears throat> I want you to bring them here to me so that I can bless them. Now Israel's eyes were dim with age so that he could not see. And Yosef brought his sons near to him and he kissed them, he embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see you again, but God has allowed me to see your children too. Joseph brought them out from between his legs, and he prostrated himself on the ground. Then Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand towards Israel's left, and Manasseh in his left hand towards Israel's right, and he brought them near to him. <clears throat> but Israel put out his right hand, he laid on the head of the younger one, Ephraim. He put out his left hand on the head of Manasseh. He intentionally crossed his hands, even though Manasseh was the firstborn. Then he blessed Joseph, the God in whose presence my fathers Abraham and Yitzhak lived, the God 
who has been my own shepherd all my day, all my life to this day. The angel who's rescued me from all harm. Bless these boys. May they remember who I am, what I stand for. Likewise, my fathers, Avraham and Yitzhak, who they were, what they stood for. May they grow into teeming multitudes on the earth. <clears throat> now, when Joseph saw that his father was laying his right hand on Ephraim's head, it displeased him. So he lifted up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head, to place it instead on Manisha's head. And Joseph said to his father, don't do it that way, my father, for, for this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. But his father refused. He said, I know that, my son. I know it. Oh, he too will become a people. He will be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother will be greater than he. His descendants will grow into many nations. And then he added this blessing on them. That day, Israel will speak of you in their own blessings by saying, May God make you like Ephraim and Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Israel then said to Joseph, You see, I'm dying. But God will be with you and will bring you back to the land of your ancestors. Moreover, I'm giving to you a Shechem, a, 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 a city, more than to your brothers. I captured it from the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. What actually happened here? Well, as I mentioned last time, the younger child of Joseph, Ephraim, was in essence given the firstborn or the double portion blessing that normally should have gone to the older child. That was Manasseh. But just as important, Jacob gave the birthright that should have belonged to his own firstborn son, Reuben, to his grandson, Ephraim. Reuben was not excommunicated from the family, but he was replaced for inheritance purposes with Joseph's son, Ephraim. How do I know this was the result? Listen to 1 Chronicles 5.1. Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, of Jacob, for he was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, of Jacob, so that Reuben is not enrolled in the genealogy according to the birthright. So here's something we must put into our minds and hold on to now for a while. The firstborn rights of inheritance for Israel's, for Jacob's children, winds up not going to the rightful heir, Reuben. But instead, those rights are given to Ephraim, who is actually a grandchild, a son of Joseph. But one of the effects of this cross-handed blessing was that Jacob adopted away these two grandchildren from Joseph, and he made them his own sons. Joseph protested. But Jacob said, well, all your future sons can be your sons. That is, Jacob wouldn't adopt away any more of Joseph's sons from him. Strange. Very strange. What possible reason could there be for doing such a thing? Well, first and foremost, these two children were no longer Egyptian but rather by means of adoption, they became Hebrews. Now let's fast forward now. Let's fast forward to several hundred years into the future. To the time after the exodus from Egypt. And we're going to cover the exodus next week. To the time of Solomon, king of Israel. Solomon is a ruler over a united Israel, but that's going to change almost immediately after his death. His son <clears throat> inherits the throne. Right away, turmoil, civil war occur. The nation of Israel is divided into two kingdoms. 
The Bible refers a number of ways to these two kingdoms, most typically as the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, or as the kingdoms of Judah and of Israel, Judah in the south, Israel in the north. Mm, there's a problem here. You see, the northern kingdom was not really called Israel after a short time. Calling that kingdom Israel is a fairly recent redaction in our Bibles. The oldest manuscripts clearly call the northern kingdom Ephraim. By now, of the twelve original tribes of Israel, two, Judah and Ephraim, have become dominant and they rule over the other ten. In biblical times, Territories tended to be named after the dominant tribe that occupied that area. So the two kingdoms that resulted from the civil war of Israel were called by the names of the two tribes that controlled them. Judah controlled the south, Ephraim controlled the north. Fast forward again, this time about 200 more years. Judah has struggled to stay separate from its pagan neighbors close to God. On the other hand, Ephraim has worked hard to associate itself with its neighbor's gods. Assyria is now a regional power and it attacks Ephraim. It empties it of its people. The people of Ephraim are scattered all over the Assyrian Empire and absorbed into the myriad cultures of Asia to the point that most of them lost their Hebrew identity. Ephraim Israel is no longer a people. Most of the people of Ephraim don't even know their heritage. Much of the ten tribes that formed Ephraim had mixed its genes, its Hebrew genes, with the Gentile people of the world. From the Western perspective, Ephraim had become lost into the world of Gentiles. Now, please pay attention to this. From Genesis forward, Ephraim and Judah, at times called Israel and Judah, are referred to as the two houses of Israel. Together they make up the whole house of Israel. That is, these two halves, if you would, of Israel, together make up all of Israel. Now, with that as a background, we fast forward again. The prophet Ezekiel, writing about 130 years after Assyria conquered Ephraim and scattered all the people, writes about a prophetic future of the people of Ephraim. And he does this in Ezekiel 37. It is fascinating. And for believers of our time, it ought to be earth shaking. If we understand what's being said, Let's read that together. Israel, uh, Ezekiel, rather, Ezekiel chapter 37. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is on page 691. Ezekiel chapter 37. Please follow along. <clears throat> With the hand of Adonai upon me, Adonai carried me out by his spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley, and it was full of bones. He had me pass by all around them. There were so many bones lying in the valley. They were so dry. And he asked me, human being, can these bones live? And I answered, Adonai Elohim, only you know that. And then he said to me, then prophesy over these bones. Say to them, dry bones, hear what Adonai has to say. To these bones, Adonai Elohim says, I will make breath enter into you. You will live. I will attach ligaments to you, make flesh grow on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you. You will live. You will know that I am Adonai. So I prophesied as ordered. And while I was prophesying, there was a, a noise, a rattling sound. It was the bones coming together, each bone in its proper place. And as I watched, ligaments grew on them. Flesh appeared, skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And next he said to me, Prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, human being, and say to the breath that Adonai Elohim says, Come from the four winds. Breathe. 
breathe on these slain so that they can live. So I prophesied and ordered. The breath came into them, and they were alive, and they stood on their feet, a huge army. And then he said to me, human being, these bones, they are the whole house of Israel. And they are saying, our bones have dried up, our hope is gone, we're completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them that Adonai Elohim says, my people, I will open up your graves and make you get out of your graves, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I'm at an eye when I've opened your graves and made you get up out of your graves, my people. I will put my spirit in you. You will be alive. Then I'll place you in your own land and you will know that I, Adonai, have spoken. I have done it, says Adonai. And the word of Adonai came to me, you human being, take one stick and write on it for Judah. And for those joined with him among the people of Israel. Next, take another stick and write on it. For Joseph, the stick of Ephraim. All the house of Israel who are joined with him. And finally, bring them together into a single stick so they become one in your hand. And when your people ask you what all of this means, tell them that Adonai Elohim says this. I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, together with the tribes of Israel who are joined with him. And put them together with the stick of Judah, and make them a single stick so that they become one in my hand. The sticks on which you write are to be in your hand as they watch. And then say to them that Adonai Elohim says, I will take the people of Israel from among the nations where they've gone and gather them from every side and bring them back to their own land. I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel and one king will be king for all of them. There will no longer be two nations. They will never again be divided into two kingdoms. They will never again defile themselves with their idols, their detestable things, or any of their transgressions. But I will save them from all the places where they've been living and sinning. And I will cleanse them so that they will be my people. I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them. All of them will have one shepherd. They will live by my rulings and keep and observe my regulations. They will live in the land I gave to Jacob, my servant, where your ancestors lived. They will live there, they, their children, their grandchildren, forever. And David, my servant, will be their leader forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them, an everlasting covenant. I will give to them increase their numbers, set my sanctuary among them forever. My home will be with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. The nations will know that I am Adonai who sets Israel apart as holy when my sanctuary is with them forever. <clears throat> Here we find what is sometimes called the two sticks prophecy or the or the, di, the the dry bones prophecy it says that in the end times in the latter days Ephraim will be rejoined with Judah the two halves of Israel will once again become united they will become a whole the whole house of Israel i want you to let that sink in for a second how could Ephraim who had mostly become part of the Gentile world. Millions of people who didn't even know that they had ancestral roots to the tribe of Ephraim, and some who do. They do suspect the connection, but they struggle to prove it. How are they going to be reunited with the tribe of Judah? But even more, who is Judah today in our time? They are the Jews. Jews are what members of the tribe of Judah have been called since the time of Babylon. Somehow, in the modern nation of Israel, which only allows, by the way, citizenship to those who can prove they are Jews, the lost and scattered people of Ephraim are going to be identified. And they're going to be allowed to migrate and to join in the land with their Jewish brethren and 
all of this stems from this odd happening from Genesis 48 and then prophesied in Ezekiel 37. And by the way, this process has already begun. And in a few weeks, we're going to talk about that in more detail. Well, let's return to our discussion now about the time of Joseph in Egypt. It's a little after 1800 BC. And the 12 tribes of Israel, all of them now in Egypt, are going to remain there for four centuries. At first as guests, then citizens, but then finally as slaves. Much has been written about the time that Israel, the Hebrews, spent in Egypt, but most of it expressing skepticism that they were even there. Interestingly, the problem is not that a large center of ancient Hebrew culture hasn't been found in Egypt. It has been. The problem is with the timing, the dating. According to archaeologists, the Hebrew culture found in Egypt does not match with the biblical timeline of when Israel was supposed to have been in Egypt. Therefore, many scholars say the Bible story of Israel's captivity and exodus must simply be a folk tale. Now, I want to help you understand this issue. Archaeologists and Egyptologists approach the matter of understanding history in terms of time. When something happened, is at least as important as did something happen, and if so, exactly what happened. And the further we go back into history, the harder it is to ascertain the sequence of events and what it all led to. Today, virtually all world history that takes place prior to about 600 BC is determined by one ancient institution. The line of Egyptian pharaohs are using common scholarly terms, the Egyptian dynasties, the pharaonic di dynasties. Now that's because the most complete records of the ancient times found thus far prior to 600 BC occurs with the Egyptians. This is because the Egyptians would carefully record certain significant events associated with each pharaoh's reign. So we have the listing of a pharaoh, major events that happened in his lifetime, then often who it was that followed him as the new pharaoh, the new ruler. Now, because Egypt had interests far and wide in Africa, all over Asia, as far as Europe to the west, India to the east, events that happened even in these far-flung areas were at times recorded, and they were attributed to whichever uh, pharaoh was reigning at that time. But only if the event was deemed important enough, and it also had a favorable outcome for Egypt. By comparing these recorded events to the records of other civilization dates, can sometime be re sometimes be reasonably extracted. Now here's the problem. This is hardly foolproof. There are major holes in the Egyptian dynastic timeline. This is why when you hear of all the excitement of a new pharaoh being discovered or something, it's because it's going to fill in another space on the timeline. That's what makes it so important to archaeologists. Sometimes there are gaps where they've never found information about a particular pharaoh. Or there isn't enough information to know which pharaoh he might have followed. So scholars have to guess to fill in the blanks. The next interesting ingredient is that in the modern scientific world, the Bible timeline is usually discarded. Because the Bible is, of course, a religious document, Archaeologists and Egyptologists generally refuse to even consider that it might be accurate. Even events that are chronicled in the Bible that would fill in large periods of time in which there is no other source of information are tossed aside as unworthy to, to uh, either consider or to even investigate. Now back to the issue of whether or not Israel was actually ever in Egypt. 
Egyptologists have indeed found the remains of an enormous Hebrew community in Egypt in the land of Goshen. This is a region of what's called Lower Egypt, right where the Bible says they were. This community was estimated to have been able to accommodate perhaps two million people. It is called in scientific circles by its archaeological name Tel Ed Daba. By its most recent historic name, it's called Avaris. And it's located right next to Pi Ramesses, the great city of the Pharaoh. It all matches up perfectly with the biblical account, except for one thing. Because of the currently accepted dating system, using what scientists call regnal dating, which is based on the incredibly incomplete, often baseless line of Egyptian royalty, archaeologists say this city of the Hebrews existed at the wrong time. And since this isn't a class on scientific anthropology, let me summarize with this. An agnostic Egyptologist named Dr. David Roll decided in the mid-1980s to take the unprecedented action of assuming only for historical, from a historical perspective, that perhaps the Bible was an accurate record. Imagine that. Through 10 years of active research and with the help of many of his non-Bible-believing colleagues, he integrated the Egyptian dating system with Bible chronology and suddenly everything started lining up. He's now making great headway among the scientific community of revamping the entire archaeological dating system that hasn't changed in 150 years. And guess what? By using his new and revised system that's still not universally accepted by the academic community, the time that this huge population of Hebrews lived in Averis in the land of Goshen in Egypt perfectly matches with the biblical story of captivity, the exodus, the conquest of the land of Canaan, and more. What a surprise. So understand, you should listen with much skepticism to A&E, the History Channel, Discovery, and others that most often attempt to refute the biblical accounts. Archaeologists have indeed found many, many biblical cities, but because the scientists want to stick to this outdated and largely discredited regnal dating system, they refuse to acknowledge these biblical archaeological finds. Not because they're not there. They are. But because they supposedly occur in the wrong time. Well, let's get back to our account of Israel and Egypt. The Bible is silent. From the time of the death of, death of Yosef, Joseph, who died at the age of 110, until the birth of Moshe, Moses. This is a period of about 300 years. Long gap. Extra biblical sources indicate that for the first 150 to 200 years after their arrival in Egypt, the Israelites prospered and their numbers grew. They just exploded. The succession of Semite, not Egyptian, pharaohs is tolerant of these Israelites, likely due to their realization of the family attachments to these distant relatives. They also remember and they continue to honor the promises made by Pharaoh to Joseph, Joseph's decrees granting land and, uh, Israeli, uh, and, and citizenship to the Israelis, and Joseph's historical position as a sort of savior of Egypt saving them from famine. But Egypt is now in turmoil. Yosef died about 1700 BC. Memories and promises can be very short-lived things. Egypt at this time was two nations, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. In addition, a few areas within the boundaries of the formerly unified nation were governed by warlords. 
tribal chieftains. It's helpful for us to know that the names Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt are exactly reversed according to our current traditions indicating direction. Upper Egypt is actually to the south. Lower Egypt, that's to the north. That's because the Upper Nile is to the south, and that's what it associates it with. Now, after years of failed attempts of dozens of factions that were seeking power, an army led by an Egyptian general from Thebes, which is modern-day Luxor, fabulous place to go to, by the way, amazing, finally overthrows the detested foreign pharaoh. It's now about 1600 BC, and this new pharaoh, who now is an Egyptian, he feels no obligation to Joseph's 200-year-old decree regarding the Israelites. The driving need for him is to reunite this fractured Egyptian society and to reestablish a strong central government. And to accomplish this, a common cause is needed. So changes are made overnight. The large Israelite popula population residing in, in Egypt is made the scapegoat for all this nation's problems. And they are suddenly regarded as a threat to the throne. Now this scenario with the Israelites later on being called Jews being blamed for a nation's problems and persecuted for it is going to repeat itself time and again in the future. Within a few years, private ownership of property, which helped the Israelites achieve prosperity in Egypt in previous years, was outlawed. The new pharaoh, an Egyptian, decreed that the temples to the gods, and that would now own 20% of the land, with the, with the remainder of the land of Egypt belonging to the pharaoh alone. Peasants had no choice but to work the land as little more than serfs. Most Israelites had been reduced to peasants. Egypt, propelled by this horrific memory of foreign control and shameful subjugation, protected now their borders at all costs. But they also directed their hatred and their insecurity inward to the foreigners, the Israelites, whose population had exploded into menacing proportions. Egypt rebuilt her armies, meant not only to defend, but to conquer with national Egyptians. The Israelites formed the foundation of the servant class workforce. They would be used for Egypt's ambitious building projects. Egypt's loyal nationalist army, together with the forced labor of the Israelites, allowed Egypt a return to glory. And once again, they became a player on the world stage. Well, the Israelites paid a very high price for their masters' imperialistic designs. Their lives were miserable, without hope. Anti-Semitism was at a fever pitch in, in uh, Egypt. Even with these impossible conditions that the Israelites suffered under, their numbers just continued to increase. This alarmed the populace and the pharaoh. The pharaoh, in an ancient method of birth control, ordered that all male Israelite children were to be killed immediately upon birth to stem the tide. Well, it's now about 1400 BC, some 600 years after Abraham lived in Ur. In Egypt, a baby boy is born to a Levite family, the family of Amram and Yehokabed, and Levites as you recall, are one of the 12 tribes of Israel. They hide this child. Knowing that the Egyptian guard is soon going to discover their secret, they embark on a desperate plan by putting this baby's fate entirely into God's hands. An Egyptian princess finds this Levite infant floating in a waterproofed basket in the Nile, and she rescues that child from sure death, probably at the mouth of a hungry Nile crocodile. The princess makes him her own. She names him Mose. Mose. We call him Moses. Mose is an Egyptian name. 
It's not a Hebrew name. It means born of. Moshe, his Hebrew name means to draw out. He was drawn out of the waters of the Nile. Now, Moses was raised in the palace of the Pharaoh. He received nothing but the best. He learned math, writing. He was taught fighting skills, accounting, and, of course, court etiquette. He would have been given authority over others, put all of these skills to use by his 13th birthday. Most people of his time had an average lifespan of 25 to 30 years. So maturing Assuming useful duties occurred pretty early by our standards. Yet all evidence is that the Israelites, for some reason, had considerably longer lifespans. Despite some Hollywood versions to the contrary, Moses was always aware of who he was. And he likely visited his birth mother very often. She even suckled him for many months after he was plucked from the Nile because his sister, Miriam, suggested as much to the Egyptian princess. One day, when Moshe was grown, he saw an Egyptian soldier strike an Israelite slave. Moshe killed the guard. He buried him in the desert sand. Why would he have done such a thing? I mean, no, notice that the soldier, we're told, didn't kill the man, didn't even maim him. He just struck him. Surely, an Egyptian soldier striking a Hebrew slave was a common everyday occurrence that he had witnessed often. Egyptian law calls for capital punishment for killing an Egyptian, no matter who the perpetrator is. Moshe well knew this. At the very least, Moshe threw away the royal life he could have chosen for himself. Could it have been that Moses, guilt-ridden, angry at being considered a half-breed by Israelite and Egyptian alike, likely unwelcome in either camp, simply could no longer tolerate watching his parents' people whipped like animals while he's living a life of luxury? In any case, Moses found out, much to his surprise, there were witnesses to his murderous act. So he fled the country. Now, he couldn't go to Canaan, where the roads and the cities were guarded by Egyptian troops who might recognize him. There would have been a warrant out for his arrest. Instead, he fled to a place of little interest to any conquering nation, and where only the hardiest souls attempted to live, the Sinai. And after trekking across the Sinai, he crossed over to the other side of a finger of the Red Sea, now called the Gulf of Aqaba, and into the land of Midian, home to desert wanderers. After an incident at a water well, water well where, where Moses protected some local girls from being bullied by herders, a Midianite priest takes him in, gives him his eldest daughter as a wife. Moshe becomes a shepherd of flocks in a barren, primitive land, and he spends the next several years contemplating this impulsive act that brought him here, fighting loneliness, trying to forget this privileged life he once lived in the Pharaoh's palace, and then learning to adapt to his new reality. He was seeking answers. Why are things as they are? If all the gods of Egypt are false, as his father-in-law Yitro, Jethro, keeps telling him, well, then who is God? Such things are the, can make a man very humble, make him very moldable. About 40 years pass. Moses is now 80 years old. He sees a flickering light off in the distance, of uncommon occurrence out in a desert wilderness. And he goes to investigate it. And on a tall hill, that the Bible alternately calls the mountain of God and Mount Horeb, and later it's known as Mount Sinai, Moses finds a bush that shines as though it's engulfed in flame, yet it doesn't burn up. In other words, the burning bush wasn't on fire. 
And as he approaches it, let's examine this. This thundering voice from above just forces him to his knees in terror. The God that he's been, reveal, uh, he's been seeking, well, he reveals himself. He reveals himself to Moses. He tells him, I'm going to send you to the Pharaoh and you will free my people. That is not what Moses had in mind for his life. And he tells God that. And God, in his mercy, makes him some promises. And Moses responds skeptically. And God produces proofs. And Moses asks God to please be excused from this task and offer some lame excuse about a speech impediment. God gets a little angry. Moses accepts his assignment. Sounds like us a little bit, doesn't it? It's of interest to note that modern Christians speculate that the speech problem Moses offered as an excuse for not wanting the job as a liberator of God's people was a lisp, maybe stuttering. Jewish tradition is that the speech problem had nothing to do with dysfunction. Rather, they believe that after all these years being raised by Egyptians, then more than 40 additional years in Midian, where the language would not have been Hebrew, Moses simply Moses simply had an extraordinarily poor grasp of the Hebrew language. Now Moses informs his Midianite family of his supernatural experience. And he takes his wife and his children and they strike out for Egypt. Now I suspect somewhere along the line he decided that what lies ahead is just too risky for his family so he sends them back. Because sometime later while leading the now freed Israelite nation through the desert Wilderness, the book of Exodus tells us about a reunion between Moses and his family. So they weren't with him. Moses' older brother, Aharon, Aaron, who will soon become the first high priest of Israel, he greets Moses upon his arrival back in Egypt. Aaron has also been visited by God. He's been told of the plan. So Aaron convinced the tribal leaders in advance of Moses' arrival that Moses had been sent from God to free them, to deliver them. And Moses and Aaron take God's message to free his people to the Pharaoh, who promptly rewards their efforts by increasing the Israelites' already deadly workload. The tribal elders, the people, are not thrilled with this turn of events, and they blame Moses. And Moses confronts God about it. Well, God at this point says some things that might be easily overlooked in the oft-told story of, of Moshe and, and Pharaoh. But what God says is truly momentous. In paraphrase, God says this to him. He says, I appeared to, to Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but I did not make myself known by my name. That is, up to now, with Moses. In history, God had never revealed his formal name to humankind. So, people called him by a number of titles. His name, however, says God is yud heh vav -Hey. Yahweh, perhaps Yehoveh. Say to the Israelite people, I am Yahweh. I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God. Here is a new beginning. A beginning with a promise from God to Moses and the Israelites, a people God is calling out to be his own. A personal God. A personal God who wants to be known by his name. A God who detests Egypt, a God who loves his people, and he's going to fight for them. This is the start, right here, of Israel's history as a nation. Moses visits Pharaoh again. He insists that the Israelites are to be freed. Pharaoh declines. Moses warns Pharaoh. Pharaoh's not used to being threatened. Pharaoh bristles with anger. He refuses to let the Israelites go. Pharaoh's refusal can be well understood when one considers that to allow the Israelites to leave would be tantamount 
to destroying the entire working class of Egypt. The Israelites represented not only the unskilled labor, but also the best craftsmen. Imagine what would happen in the United States if all of our carpenters, plumbers, electricians, cement layers, steel workers, roofers, painters, laborers of every kind just suddenly disappeared. This is exactly what was being proposed to Pharaoh by Moses. You can understand why that didn't settle too well. So to attain the release of his people, something drastic was going to be needed. Jehovah attacks the Egyptians through their supposed gods. The Nile turns to blood. Frogs inundate the land. Boils inflict the people. Locusts attack their crops. Finally, God lets the Egyptian people and their Pharaoh feel this devastation that the Israelites felt at the time of Moses' birth. All of their firstborn die. And interestingly, this deadly curse applied to all Egyptian-owned livestock as well. We'll continue next time. As Israel readies itself to leave Egypt to chart a new but unknown course. Please rise. Thank you.